Okay, so uh, I'm Gordon Mitchell, the Lord's Witnesses Christian Church. Um, in this video I'm going to attempt, hopefully succeed, in proving that there is a God. Um, without using the Bible, uh, just from some logical arguments. Um, now, I've always thought that if one was intelligent enough, one could just see logically that there must be a God. And, in fact, I, I, that is the case, and I hope to be able to demonstrate that in this talk. But there's one, it's not quite that simple, because people believe what they want to believe, not what is true. They believe, they will readily believe a convenient lie over an inconvenient truth. So there's one other thing you need in order to see God, and that's a pure heart, by which is not meant the heart of a saint who never commits a sin. When Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, he didn't mean only people like Mother Teresa who never think about doing anything bad um, will see God. He meant people whose heart is straight. It hasn't, it's not coming from an angle. It's seeking the truth. That he meant people with an academic, free-thinking, uh, unencumbered heart that, that searches it's like a, a judge or a lawyer who just wants the truth rather than a lawyer who wants to win a case or a judge who wants to make a political statement or an example. Uh, it, it's like an academic who, who doesn't care if his whole subject is, burnt, is shot down in flames if he discovers a new truth when compared to an academic who just wants another 20 years in his chair in the university and doesn't care what happens to the subject as long as he gets his salary the next 20 years. That, that's the difference between a pure heart and a heart coming from an angle. Uh, or in religious terms, it's the difference between um, leavened bread, which is bread cooked from an angle, uh, or, or unleavened bread, which is pure bread, the, where the idea is to impart direct information, not part, impart information which is useful to an angle for a church. So, I don't know if you've got a pure heart or not. Um, I hope you do. Uh, if you have, then uh, you, there will be no block on you accepting information that might reveal the existence of God. However, if you come from the angle of, oh no, no, I don't want there to be a God because God will, will want to control my life. So those are the two things. If you think clearly enough, and if your heart's open, you can see Him. So let's start off with this observation, why people don't see Him. Um, in the old days in Egypt, they deified the pharaohs. The pharaohs were so powerful that they thought they must be gods. And so they, the, the people turned these incredibly powerful pharaohs into gods and worshipped them. Likewise in Rome, the Caesars declared themselves to be gods. Um, and they were incredibly powerful and people believed it and worshipped them as gods. Today, the incredibly powerful thing is not politicians in this world, it's science and technology. And we have done to science and technology what the Egyptians did to their pharaohs and what the Romans did to their Caesars. There's nothing new in it. We have deified it and used it to replace God. Whereas Newton, and I, who invented half of modern mathematics, all of Newtonian dynamics, a whole lot of physics and optics, he... I think his, his well, according to um, one of his biographies, or, um, his idea was that the purpose of natural philosophy was to make God manifest through his works. So the, the purpose of science was to show the existence of God by looking at the perfection of his works, which Newton was able to discover in terms of Newtonian dynamics and the rules of the solar system and physics and optics and half of pure mathematics, that half being calculus, which, which he invented along with Leibniz. So, the fathers of a lot of science never deified science, even though they invented it, uh, but, or most of it, but um, today we have deified it. We think, oh, we know so much about science and technology, we don't need a god. Whereas, in fact, the two are not mutually exclusive. I mean, Mary gave birth without sleeping with her husband. Uh, today, that was a miracle 2,000 years ago. 
Today it happens all the time, it's called IVF. And so there's an example of science um, working together with God. So we now can understand that God basically did IVF on Mary. Well, appropriately, we'll start with Newton's orrery, which is um, Newton's brilliant proof that there is a God. Worked like this. He had an orrery in his rooms at Cambridge, which is a device where you turn a handle, and it's, it's a model of the solar system, and you turn a handle and all the planets whiz round the sun uh, in their courses, which I doubt were elliptical in his or orrery, but I, I don't know how sophisticated it was. And one day, Halley, of Halley Comet, Halley's Comet fame, walked into his room and said, oh, there's a wonderful orrery you have there, Sir Isaac. Um, who made that orrery? And Newton replied, knowing Halley to be an atheist, he replied, no one made it, Halley. No, it wasn't made by anybody. Halley said, don't be silly, don't mess around with me. Tell me who made the orrery. He said, no, nobody made it. And he said, he said why are you playing games with me? And Newton's response was, you have no problem in believing that the original, which is far more complex and intricate than this crummy model, was made by nobody. Where is your issue in believing that this model was made by nobody? So he exposed that Halley's beliefs were not dependent on logic or truth. They were dependent on his heart condition. He believed what he wanted to believe, not what was true. Right, second proof is um, on a BBC science documentary uh, about DNA, there was a, a professor at University of Queen of London, Queen Mary College, who said this. He said, we've sequenced human DNA, and as a result, we know all the base codes in, in a typical human DNA, four billion of them, the base pairs. And he said, we have the entire vocabulary, therefore, of the human DNA, but we do not know the grammar, and therefore we're unable to construct a sentence. Those were more or less his words. Um, and so we don't know really how to use it yet. Now when you think about his words, this is what they mean. A sentence is something constructed from a vocabulary using, by an intelligence, using a grammar. So by him saying that we don't know the grammar, he was saying that an intelligence wrote this DNA. In other words, it wasn't designed by random chance. Because if random chance designed it, which has, hasn't any intelligence, it wouldn't need a grammar. So basically, uh, God is the poet of our DNA. There is, there is a, our DNA has a grammar, we don't know it, we only know the vocabulary. Because it has a grammar, it has an intelligence which uses the grammar on the vocabulary to produce the result. So he was actually proving there was a God, if you think about it clearly. All right, next proof. Ah, this is a cute one. There's an intelligent design video which has a close-up of this amazing bacterium, some type of paramecium thing, which has a corkscrew-type tail. And in its bum, <laughs> its bacteria, there's an electric motor, an eight pole, I think it was, electric motor. It may not be an eight poles. And you can see it in the bacteria. And you look at this thing, and it is plainly an electric motor. And, and the way it propels itself is its corkscrew tail goes round and round, and that's how it flies through the water, this bacteria. Uh, and basically, you look at that thing, and how anybody can look at that bacteria and think it wasn't engineered by an engineer, I really don't know, because it looks like a, it looks like a typical piece of human engineering. I mean, it isn't. It's, it's either engineered by nature, blind nature, or by uh, the angels on their... Well, let me, let me just say this. The, the prevalent theory for how we all came here is, well, there isn't one, but how we evolved from the first cell to being multi-celled is that, you know, one cell became two cells, became ten cells, became, and then they d differentiated and they, they became, and, and there's a sort of continuous diff deformation path from the first cell to the human being. And uh, that, that, the theory is that random mutations occur and every possibility is tried and the rubbish ones are then removed by natural selection and then the result is the human. 
Um, I'm going to put forward a different theory, which is that we are designed exactly the same way as everything else is designed, by intelligences on a computer. And then you press print, and out, a biological printer, and out comes the animal. I mean, we're almost there now. We can almost do that. We can do it with yeast, um, jumping a stage. Um, you, if you want now, you can go on the internet, you can design your own yeast, and you can, um, you know, press print, and it will go to a company who makes these things, they'll change the DNA of the yeast, and the thing will eat, uh, you know, dandelions, and crap diesel, uh, because it's genetically designed to do that. And so we already have a biological printer of sorts that can make a yeast with a given DNA. But you can take that to the next level and you design a jaguar or an elephant or a giraffe and you press print and out comes the fetus and, all, and it grows into, the, you know, you have, a, you have some, some kind of mechanical incubator or biological incubator and, and there is creation. So the way we create things, you know, the way that people design things today is they do it on a computer and they go to computer robots who then build the thing and, and there it is. They just have to design it and then you effectively press print, which can either be robotic or biological or some method, and out comes the product. That's how we design everything on this planet. And what I'm trying to argue is, well, that's how we were designed. Exactly the same way. Um, and that, I, I can hardly dignify that idea as a theory. Uh, it's how everything on this planet has, has been designed and is presently designed. It's just that we're getting so much better at it that we can now actually see how the angels might have done it. You know, if you're an angel and you, 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 all you do is you take the, the various routines... In France, imagine you're an angel and you want to design a new yeast. Well, you take the, all the yeast subroutines, decide which... pick and, and mix which... what characteristics you want the yeast to have, press print, and there it is. Uh, you know, and we can do that today with a single-celled organism. The day will come in the, in the near future when we can do it with a multi-celled organism, and um, that's what we are. Here's another cute proof that there's a God, which is a bit um, technical, but I, I think it's a good proof. Uh, as I said, the, the length of the human genome is four giga... is four billion base pairs, and there's four possible base pairs, which is a two-bit code, so it's, it's four billion times two bits, which is eight gigabits, which is one gigabyte. So one gigabyte is the length of your DNA. Uh, Windows 7 is 12 gigabytes, so Windows 7 can, uh, as I said in a previous talk, you know, it can open a, 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 an internet browser, an Excel spreadsheet and a Word document, perhaps, and do a few other things before crashing. Uh, whereas a human being, human DNA, creates an entire human being, uh, <laughs> which can write software like Windows, and um, it does that in a twelfth of the amount of coding that Microsoft Windows 7 uses. And I run a software company and I, I, I did a PhD in numerical analysis uh, solving fluid dynamics equations on a computer in Fortran in those days. And so I spent my life in software and I can tell you the better the software writer the shorter his code. And to be able to code uh, human DNA in one gigabyte compared with what Windows achieves, which is nothing in comparison in 12 gigabytes, is, is fantastic intelligence. And the difference in intelligence between the creators of the human and, the, and, and Microsoft software coders is, 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 is billions in, in orders, of, you know, it's, it's multiple orders of magnitude because that's the difference in the compactness of the code. And, the, and the, the, it's a direct uh, relationship. So you, you can tell how much more intelligent the angels are than us by the... the how, I mean, how big would human DNA be if Microsoft had written it? <laughs> uh, right, here's another proof. Uh, this is a cute one. Well, this is actually from the Bible. I'll, I'll quote Psalm 139, verse, 60, uh, verse 16. Your eyes saw even the embryo of me, and in your book, all its parts were down in writing, all the parts in writing of the embryo, as regards the days when they were formed, and there was not yet one among them. All I'm trying to prove from this is that Psalm 139, written 3,000 years ago, plainly says that all our parts are down in writing. In other words, there's a blueprint 
to all our parts, and that blueprint is DNA. DNA was not discovered 3,000 years ago in the days of David writing Psalms. It was discovered by Crick and Watson in 19 something, 50, in the 20th century anyway. Right, here's another astounding proof, to me the most convincing, that there's a God. Which again, you can see it if you're clever enough. Um, so, here it is. In order to make the film Toy Story 2, I think it was, um, you needed 22,000 computers, or CPUs, running at several gigahertz. And they had to work continuously for 18 months in order to make 100 minutes of film. And Tom Hanks used to say when he was doing the voiceovers for that film, he'd turn up, you know, one day, say a few words, go home, come back three months later and say a few more, once they'd rendered the next ten minutes of film. So, it takes 22,000 modern computers going at 4 gigahertz, 18 months, to make a hundred minutes of a movie, okay? Now when you go to sleep and you dream, you see in real time a movie, which is 3D rendered, and you interact with that movie uh, throughout the dream. The human brain cannot, it has nowhere near the computational power to create that dream. It cannot be the movie studio for that dream. It can screen the dream. It has enough power to screen a dream. Your eyes, for example, see, uh, they go at 10 hearts. They take 10 shots every second, which is why movies are shot at 24 frames per second, so that when you, you show a 24 frame per second movie to someone, it looks continuous because their eyes only, only open and shut and take a, take a snap every, every 10 times a second. So if, if you're showing them snaps 24 times a second, we think it's continuous. That is how slow our eyes are. Our eyes go at 10 hearts, right? 10 a second, 10 hearts. Computers go at 4 gigahertz, that's 4 billion operations a second. Our eyes operate at 10 per second. Our eyes are directly connected to our brain. Our brain goes a bit faster than 10 a second because our ears can hear a 5 millisecond gap. So the ears are going at 200 cycles a second because 5 millisecond is a 200th of a second. 5 milliseconds is. So let's say, let's, I don't think the brain does go at 200 um, hearts, but let's say it does. It goes at 200 hearts. What is the chances of a brain that goes at 200 hearts in real time creating a movie that requires 22,000 computers that go at 4 billion hearts 18 months to make. Zero. It's absolutely impossible. If you understand anything about computers, it's totally impossible for the human brain to make in real time a dream. It can't do it. It can screen a dream, that's easy. Because we, we can do that. You only need to shoot it, you need to screen it 10 times a second and, and you've cracked it. So, dreams are not made by the human mind. They're in fact made by an angelic mind. Uh, this is a proof that all of us have an associated angelic mind. Okay, we're all backed up on an angelic server. When you're born again, you gain your own um, dedicated server. Before you're born again, you're on a shared server. That, that, is how, that is our security. This is why God says, do not fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill the body and the soul in Gehenna. Uh, now, that's a scripture nobody understands because it's deliberately written by the Holy Spirit in a, in a contorted way so that you have to work to get the answer because the scripture says, in the sweat of his brow shall he eat bread, referring to Adam and all of Adam's sons, which is us. So you have to think, you have to sweat in your brow, not in your arms, not in your legs, in your brow. You have to think about what that means. Now, a soul is a body with a spirit in it. A spirit is software, it's you. The, the, the soul, the body is hardware, all right? My spirit, Gordon, is running on my brain at the moment. And um, this is my hardware, and inside is me, my software. And God doesn't, it doesn't say fear him who can kill the spirit, because nobody can kill the spirit. The spirit is immortal. But God can kill your soul by putting you in Gehenna, 
where you're soulless, you do not have a soul. Gehenna is hell. Uh, and in hell, you don't have a soul. You actually timeshare with, with a whole bunch of other people of soul, but you don't have your own soul. You're on a shared soul, a shared angelic soul in hell. And right now, we're all on a shared angelic soul, which is actually, in biblical terms, the second death. The second death means you don't have your own angel. Uh, you aren't just an angel. But we do have an angelic shared server, unless you're born again. When you're born again, you're moved. We, are, we understand all this technology from the internet. You move from a shared server to a dedicated server. That is being born again. But if, if somebody shot me now, it wouldn't be a case of God saying, Oh, quick, there's a bullet going towards Gordon Head. Download him, or we're going to lose him. Quick, download him. Oh dear, we've only got half of him. This is a disaster. We'll have to resurrect half of Gordon. It doesn't work like that. Everything I do is backed up. I have an, I have an angelic server, and everything is backed up on that server. Uh, what you're seeing here is the human. I have a brain that is really slow and couldn't possibly create a dream in real time. Something that we would need 22,000 computers and 18 months and 100 humans working on and a bunch of Hollywood A-listers in order, in order to do. Okay? My brain can't do that. It can screen a movie, it can be a movie cinema, it, it, but it is not a movie production studio. Right? My brain is not DreamWorks. DreamWorks is the angelic brain. I'm... I'm um, what is it? Cine world. The, and and uh, the angelic brain is DreamWorks. That's DreamWorks. And, and the angelic brain is, is orders of, well, millions of times faster than the human brain in order to be able to create a dream in real time. And if you'll find it, if you don't sleep for a couple of nights, you can't remember anything the next day. That's because during the night you download or you upload, actually, stuff from your human brain. Well, actually, I think it's real time, but there's some kind of, it's, it must be real time. But... Uh, continuous backup. We understand that in modern technology, the continuous backup of, of data from one place to another. Well, every second you live, I should imagine, you're continuously backed up between your human brain and your angelic brain. Uh, but at night, there seems to be some data reorganization enabling you to remember, so you probably clear the buffer of what you've experienced in the day and, and store it away in the angelic server. Um, I mean, how many people watching this can remember a 16-digit credit card number? I mean, I can remember one, not two. A lot of people can't remember one. And you're telling me that a brain that can't remember a 16-digit credit card number, or at least can't remember two of them, can manufacture a movie in real time and then interact with it in a dream. Totally impossible. Cannot occur. So, this one is really obvious an obvious proof that there's a God. I'm using science to prove there's a God. Most people use science to prove there isn't a God by saying science is so powerful, you know, we don't need a God anymore because we can see it all with science. So who needs God? We don't need, the world wasn't created in seven days by God. You know, it was created by the Big Bang and then uh, space-time and then, uh, you know, quantum foam and all these things that may, may well be true but uh, all you're doing is seeing more closely, as Newton would say, the, the manifestation of the, of the uh, works of God. Anyway, computer viruses, how do they work? Well, there's people out there who are just as good at Microsoft engineers, or better, at writing computer programs. So they find a flaw in Windows, and they exploit it, and they make a virus which, you know, gets your operating system working for the virus, which is working for them, if they want to make money or get your data or whatever. So we all know how that computer viruses will require an intelligence of sort of equal ability, shall we say, to the writers of the operating system. Okay, now let's go to human viruses. Is it a giant stretch to understand that a human virus is written by some demons who would knew just about as much about the design of the human operating system as the angels who created us. It's the same thing. How is it that the pathology of all computer viruses is almost identical to the pathology of human viruses? You, you know, it, it's because they're, they're written in exactly the same way. For example, um, they recently found out that, that, that a certain form of cancer um, manages to turn off the immune system by, by releasing an enzyme. It turns off the 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 immune system's ability to attack it. So my question is, how does a dumb virus, which has no intelligence, how does it even know the human body has an immune system? 
How does it evolve? What did he do? Randomly put out a whole bunch of chemicals in the vain hope that it was in a host with an immune system which had one particular chemical which turned off that immune system. There's no way random chance can do that. It, we were quite obviously hacked. Just as every computer virus is a hack of Windows or of MacOS or of Android or of your telephone, so every human virus is a hack of our operating system. And, and my, my favourite example of this is that this unpronounceable fungus which is called <coughs> Ophiocordyceps unilateralis or something like that. What this fungus does is it invades an ant in the jungle and the ant lives in the top of the trees in the canopy of the jungle. When it invades this ant, this is a game from the BBC, it, why am I advertising the BBC? It, it, um, it gives it an epileptic fit, the purpose of which is for the ant to then fall off the tree onto the jungle floor which has the correct humidity for the fungus to reproduce. It then, this fungus, hacks the ant's motor system and causes it to walk up a leaf to the height of 25 centimetres plus or minus 2 centimetres in every occasion. It then causes its jaws to lock into the stem on the underside of the leaf to lock it into place. It then eats away the muscles that would release the jaws so that it's stuck at that exact height which happens to be the perfect temperature and humidity for the fungus to reproduce. It then kills the ant, sticks its, its stem and whatever it's called through the ant's head and reproduces. So here's my question. How did a dumb fungus, which is a single-celled animal which has absolutely no intelligence, how did it know any to do any of that? How did it know that, that the ant was in the top of a canopy? How did it know that if it fell to the bottom it would be the right temperature and humidity? How did it hack the ant to such an incredibly successful degree that we can't even do today? We can't make an ant walk up to 25 plus centimetres, plus or minus 2 centimetres, and then uh, get it to lock its jaws into an underside of a leaf stem that's strong enough to support the ant, and then get it and then eat away the correct muscles. Well, we, could, we could probably eat away the correct muscles, but we don't know how to make an ant do that. So obviously the people who designed that fungus knew more about the ant's physiology than we know. And guess what? They were the people, they were the people who, who were just as good at... They were, the angels designed the ant and the demons designed the fungus. Just as, I, I hate to call Microsoft engineers angels, but they're the good guys in a, in, in a sense. And, and the people who designed viruses are certainly the bad guys. Uh, okay, we, ca we cannot do this without talking about the Galapagos Islands, where, you know, where Darwin went. And he saw these fi finches with different sized beaks. And he deduced that this was the origin of the species. The what happened was a uh, finch flew to a different island and then uh, you know, there were different food sources. And so it, it, it got hit by a, a uh, cosmic ray and it mutated into a beak of a different size. And then this was a new species because the ones with which, which randomly mutated into a beak of a different size found it easier to eat the particular fruit that was on the one island compared with another island. So then you get a bit of finch with a beak like this and a finch with a beak like that and a finch with a beak like this and a finch with a beak like that. And, and um, there are 46 different... Uh, sorry, and so there's all these... Different, and he then came back and he, he didn't actually think when he came back that he did, found anything but gold who was at his college at Cambridge, told him, no, this could be speciation, this could be the origin of the species. And, and that's what his proposal was, and it got accepted by everybody because it meant there didn't need to be a god, and that there's an agenda there. Anyway, the, the problem with his theory is that uh, there's a book called The Beak of the Finch, which is written to support him, but it reveals that these guys went uh, in the last century to the Galapagos Islands, and they found that two finches with totally different beaks were able to mate, and they had all the 46 children and grandchildren. So it isn't true uh, that they're in different species, these finches with different beaks, which is hardly surprising, considering that dogs, which have different hair, different legs, different everything, and look totally different, can mate. You know, they're all in the same species, you know, Canis lupus, they, they all came from the, from the wolf, basically. Uh, so. There was no speciation that he detected, and the definition of a species in his day was breeding group. And, and what we found in this century is that these finches are in the same breeding group. And, and all that happens, I would submit, 
is that there's a genetic flexibility in the finch species to have a beak of different sizes, just as, as there is in the dog species to have legs of different sizes and bodies of different sizes and all the rest of it, which is why we go to these breedings of dog from one dog. Um, it's not, they don't get hit by cosmic rays. There's flexibility, well they do, but they, that doesn't cause the, you know, otherwise you'd have dogs with 15 legs and, and 4 heads and, and 19 ears. Uh, they're, they're, they're not random mutations. Every species have a, has a certain amount of genetic flexibility, so that if its environments change, it can, it, it, its DNA can causes it to adapt. You know, all that happened was that the, the finches that went to these environments where you needed a longer beak, that the DNA, um, when you give birth, it's not a random mutation, I would submit. I'd say that when uh, baby finches are made, some have longer beaks than others because of the, 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 the flexibility of the DNA. And that's what causes the longer beak. And then the ones with the longer beak breed more, and so that particular gene gets expressed more. It, it is natural selection, but the cause is not uh, random uh, mutations. The cause is the genetic flexibility built into the DNA in the first place by the angels who knew that this species might need a different size beak in certain environments. Uh, I think... That is it. Thank you very much.